Organic chemistry and science in general is full of words that have been invented by squishing other words together. If I squish the words alkene and alcohol together, for example, then I make a new word, enol. If I combine the words hybrid and carcinoma, then I make a new word, hybridoma. And to use my dorky joke from before, if I squish the words payless and worthers together, then I get the new word, worthless. The humorous nature of scientific terms brings me back to a time when I was taking Biology 1210 as a student at Utah State University. While taking that class, I learned about a transport enzyme called adenylyl cyclase. Yes, I said that correctly, adenylyl cyclase. There are two YLs at the end of the word in sequence, one after the other. I'll never forget that name, because having two YLs back to back at the end of a word to me just sounds absolutely hilarious. While I was studying this term with my friends, I used to make extra fun of the word by calling it a cyclase. Now I realize that tangent has nothing to do with this slide, but I just like tangents sometimes, so I thought I'd throw it at you. The aldol reaction, which we covered at the end of our last lecture, is another one of these combined terms. To review it, I want to remind you that if we take an aldehyde or a ketone, as shown here, and treat it with a base, the base will strip the alpha hydrogen, giving me this enolate. That enolate then stirs around in solution and sees another molecule of starting material, aldehyde or ketone. The negatively charged carbon will close in on that carbonyl carbon, thrusting the electrons up to give this intermediate. This intermediate then lingers until it gets protonated by water to give this product, which we can redraw as this. This product, you'll notice, is an aldehyde at the end with an alcohol on the beta carbon. Thus, we can say that it's a beta hydroxy aldehyde. In other words, the aldol reaction takes an aldehyde starting material and makes a product that has an aldehyde in it and an alcohol in it. So if I take the two terms aldehyde and alcohol and squish them together, I make the word aldol. The Claisen condensation is very similar to the aldol reaction, except that it involves two esters instead of two aldehydes or ketones. The product also looks very similar to an aldol product, except that it has a beta ketone instead of a beta alcohol. Here's the mechanism. We begin with an ester, once again, instead of an aldehyde or a ketone as we would in the aldol reaction. We treat it with a base. Now I have to point out something here. This base has to look exactly like the ester component, so except that it has a negative charge on the oxygen. So this would be the sodium or potassium alkoxide equivalent of this ester portion of the molecule. That's relevant because if I had an alkyl chain dangling off of this oxygen in my base that was different from the alkyl chain in the ester. Then the base would just come into this carbonyl. Electrons would go up, electrons would go down and kick off the ester group to do a transesterification. Because I'm starting with an ester ba uh, or <laughs> because I'm starting with a base that is a complementary base to the ester group dangling off here then even if it does do uh, or add into the carbonyl, the product of that competitive reaction is identical to the starting material. With that said, now we get back to the mechanism. My alkoxide base, once again complementary to the ester starting material, comes in, strips an alpha proton to give me this enolate. That enolite stirring in solution then looks around and sees another molecule of starting material. The negatively charged carbon adds into the carbonyl, thrusting the electrons onto the oxygen to give this intermediate. Now this might look really weird to you, but what it is is it's the product of two of these materials getting together. 
joined at this carbon thrusting into this carbonyl carbon. Now this is very similar to the corresponding intermediate in the aldol reaction, except for this one major difference. In an aldol reaction, I've begun with an aldehyde or ketone. So instead of having an OR group here, I've got an H or an alkyl group. Now, an H or an alkyl group are not good leaving groups. By comparison, an OR group is. So at this stage, what occurs is the negative charge on the oxygen comes down and kicks off that leaving group. Now that does not happen with an aldol reaction. The O minus lingers until it gets protonated to form an OH. But because I have this leaving group for my ester starting material, the O minus comes down, kicks off the leaving group to form this double bond. This is my final Claisen condensation product. Now I'm going to redraw this pretty, but to help facilitate this visually, I've numbered our carbons beginning at the ester carbonyl carbon here. So carbon 1, 2, 3, and 4 gives me my main chain. If I redraw that looking a little bit prettier all in a straight line, you'll see I've got carbon 1, that's my ester carbonyl carbon. Carbon 2 has this R chain dangling off of it. Carbon 3 has the carbonyl carbon here, that's the ketone. And carbon 4 is a CH2 bound to an R group. You can see that the product of a Claisen condensation, in contrast with that of an aldol reaction, is a beta keto ester. So I begin with an ester, treat it with a complementary alkoxide base, and get that ester to condense on a second molecule of starting material, ultimately arriving at a beta keto ester, that is, a carbon-oxygen double bonded here. You'll remember that the product of the aldol reaction is a beta hydroxy, a single bonded OH to this beta carbon. The Robinson annulation is a sweet application of this kind of chemistry. Let's look at our starting materials and compare them with the product. We start with a ketone and react it with another ketone uh, that's alpha beta unsaturated and we ultimately end up with a fused cyclohexenone. This is a, an alkene, a ketone fused to this ring like this. You might look at this and say, say what? Oh yeah, we start with a ketone, react it with an alpha beta unsaturated ketone and end up with a fused cyclohexenone ring. So how do we do that? Well, here's the mechanism. Beginning from my cyclohexenone, or cyclohexanone, sorry, I strip that with my base to generate this enol. This enol then does a Michael addition into my alpha beta unsaturated ketone. In other words, it's doing a 1,4 or conjugate addition into the double bond carbon. Electrons flip here, electrons flip up to give me my negatively charged uh, oxygen here. Negatively charged oxygen closes down like a trap door to give a double bond. And these electrons reach out to grab a proton from solvent to give this intermediate. At this stage, another molecule of base is going to strip a proton, but this time it's stripping it from this terminal methyl carbon. So this terminal methyl carbon then gets a negative charge. And this enolate condenses back onto the carbonyl carbon present for my cyclohexanone. Electrons go up, give me a minus charge on this oxygen, which strips a proton from solvent to give me this beta hydroxy ketone intermediate. An E2 elimination of water. That is stripping a hydrogen here, dumping the electrons down and kicking off water as a leaving group, then gives me my final product. Now that might look like an amazing, crazy mechanism. But I, if you're puzzled by it, I invite you to pause this and look at it for long enough until it looks pretty straightforward. Now I gotta tell you, I think this reaction is absolutely amazing. In fact, if it doesn't make you cry with wonder and amazement, then you must be a soulless monster. Well, okay, it's not quite that amazing. But 
it is a whole heck of a lot cooler than throwing up a stomach full of Cheerios, which I have done. To this day, I still can't eat Cheerios without retching a little bit in my heart. We now arrive at reaction number 8 in our chapter 19 series, acid-catalyzed decarboxylation. You see, if you have a carbonyl group that's beta to a carboxylic acid in your compound, you can remove the acid group by heating it up. In other words, we look at the starting material. It has a carbonyl that's beta to the carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acid group's highlighted in yellow. I can strip that by heating it up, releasing the carboxylate as, carb, uh, as CO2, carbon dioxide, and eventually form this product. This negatively charged carbon gets protonated in the quench, giving, uh, effectively removing the CO2 from the starting material. And this kind of chemistry can be applied to starting materials that look like this, a moronic ester. Uh, oh, sorry, I... I mean a malonic ester. This reaction sequence shown here, called a malonic ester synthesis, is pretty straightforward. First of all, I take this dicarbonyl compound, it's really a dicarbonyl ester, or a diester, uh, and I hit it with a complementary base. Once again, this base has to match the ester portion of the molecule over here. So complementary base strips an alpha hydrogen. Then that alpha hydrogen gets alkylated with an alkyl halide. And then I hydrolyze and strip off CO2 from one of these groups to ultimately arrive at this product. So what in the e am I talking about? Well, here's the mechanism. Once again, I begin with this malonic or moronic ester. I treat it with my complementary alkoxide base, and that base strips an alpha hydrogen. Remember, the reason I have to pick a complementary base is because if I picked an alkoxide base that had a different R group from the R group present in the ester, then it would just add into the carbonyl instead and do a transesterification reaction. In real life, it is adding into the carbonyl even under these conditions, but any time it does that competitively, it just ends up regenerating starting material. So effectively, I stir my malonic ester with a complementary alkoxide base. It strips this alpha hydrogen and gives me this enolate. This enolate is resonance stabilized into two carbonyls. This is now going to stir with my alkyl halide. That negatively charged carbon comes into the uh, alkyl group, kicks off my bromide, and alkylates singly at that alpha carbon. At this stage, I'll heat my diester up with acid water, and it will remove the ester groups and replace them with OHs. You guys might remember uh, or think about the mechanism uh, being like ones that we've addressed before. Water comes into the carbonyl, electrons go up, electrons go down, and kick off an alcohol on both sides to generate a dicarboxylic acid. Now, I've drawn it kind of funny with this H down here, but it, that will, the reason for that will become apparent now that I show the mechanism. At this stage, as I'm heating this up with acid and water, and this reaction is called hydrolysis as we go from a diester and replace the ester moieties with OHs. Water molecule comes in, grabs one of those hydrogens, thrusts the electrons up there, and bumps these electrons on to that alpha carbon. What products does it make? Well, you'll notice that if I take these electrons and close them like a door on a hinge, it forms a double bond between this carbonyl carbon and this oxygen. That product is carbon dioxide, CO2. You'll also notice that I end up with a negative charge on this alpha carbon. The only reason that this kind of thing is even possible is because it's resonance stabilized into this carbonyl. This is the reason why it only works for malonic esters, which are esters that have dicarbonyls here. This stage, the acid that's been formed when this water stripped this proton, then protonates this alpha carbon to generate my final product. So what is the net reaction? I start with a malonic ester, 
hit it with base, strips his proton, that negatively charged carbon gets alkylated with an alkyl halide, and then ultimately stir with water and acid at high temperature. It hydrolyzes both of these esters, converting them to OHs, and then one of those ester groups gets torn off as CO2 to arrive at this carboxylic acid product. Believe it or not, you can do this under dialkylating conditions. In other words, if I stir this with a complementary alkoxide base and an alkyl halide, I can singly alkylate here at the alpha carbon. And then if I want, I can take that product, isolate it, and stir it again with a complementary alkoxide base and a different alkyl halide. That will ultimately put two different alkyl groups on this alpha carbon. If I then stir that product with, oh yeah, I've shown that here. <laughs> See that? Isn't that cool? So I've alkylated once with one alkyl group, and then alkylated a second time with a second alkyl group. If I hit that with acid, water, and heat, it hydrolyzes both of these esters to OHs, and then ultimately removes one of those carboxylic acid groups as CO2 to form this dialkylated carboxylic acid. That concludes all the chemistry for chapter 19. So I want you to take a break, run around, stand up, sit down, uh, have an enjoyable day, and uh, gear up and rest for the next presentation that will be posted online uh, shortly for chapter 20.